Okay, so today we really have um, kind of two topics. Um, so the first topic is continuing this interpretation of classical linear logic and intuitionistic linear logic. Um, then um, talking about mix, which is a, a rule that sometimes has been proposed as an extension of linear logic. We'll see what that is. And then we'll talk a little bit about proof nets. Okay. And we can only talk a little bit about it because I only know a little bit about it. And so I can only talk a little bit about it. Okay. Okay, so interpreting classical linear logic, intuitionistic linear logic. So let me remind you, we had this translation. Um, so we defined not with respect to P of A was defined as A linear O P. And then we had a translation of A uh, with respect to P, and um, this was here a proposition in classical linear logic, and we got some A prime here, and this was a proposition in intuitionistic linear logic. And um, then we kind of plausibly argued, okay, a theorem of this form. If you have, uh, in classical linear logic, you can prove sigma, so that's in CLL. Um, so if this Then, um, from the negation with respect to P of the translation of sigma with respect to P, we can prove P, okay? Um, and this is pointwise, right? You do the negation and the translation for each thing in sigma, okay? Piece by piece, okay? And so we kind of went through this proof to see how the proof rules here would be translated into proofs over here. And in fact, we use that to motivate exactly what the translation would be. And if you remember, the translation would be called double negation translation because there were a lot of double negations um, in the translation. Okay. Um, okay. So we want this to go in both directions. So we also want to make sure if this is provable, then the sigma is provable in the original one. So that we know that we faithfully model classical linear logic reasoning and intuitionistic linear logic, right? We want an if and only if. So the question is, how do we go in the other direction? How do we go from here back to here? And so I thought it would be worth spending just a few minutes talking about this because there's often the temptation um, to try to prove everything in a certain style of induction um, over the structure of proofs and works very, very well when you go from here to here but it usually does not work very well when you try to go from here back to here, okay? And this is because the, 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 the structure of the proofs here in the image of the translation is um, not so tightly controlled. Things can be done in weird orders, okay? You can try to control it by saying, oh, it must be focused on all these things, but generally what happens is that in the image of one of these logical translations, um, you can simulate the inference that are done here over here, but there are some things you can do here that are hard to see how they would correspond to something the, in the original logic. So usually the two proofs in the two direction work very differently. Structural induction this way, and some other consideration the other way. Okay, so hopefully I can piece together how the, the, the thing in the other direction works. Okay, so what we need first is a, so this is, so we were trying to go in the other direction. Okay, so, so we need some kind of a lemma, okay, that gets, uh, connects intuitionistic linear logic with classical linear logic. Okay, so that's not gonna get us all the way there, but it's a very important lemma. It basically says that um, if you interpret them sort of directly, um, sort of not talking about this double negation translation, then the things which are true intuitionistically is a subset of the things which are true classically. Okay, so you're used to this from the connection between classical and intuitionistic logic because you get intuitionistic logic from classical one by essentially taking out the law of the excluded middle. So if you prove something intuitionistic, it's classically true. If you prove something classically, it may or may not be intuitionistic. It depends on whether you happen to use the law of excluded middle. Okay, and so something similar holds here. So the lemma is something like um, if we can prove gamma delta A, and this is in the intuitionistic linear logic case, then some translation of that 
Okay, we don't have exactly the same judgment, but some translation of that would be provable in classical linear logic. So what would that be? Yeah? Why not gamma? Okay, so the question is, don't we have to negate gamma also? Because we're taking it from the left-hand side where it's an assumption, right, to the right-hand side. So yeah, we also have to negate that, okay? Um, by the way, this is the same as taking bang gamma and negating that, because the, by duality, this propagates inside becomes why not? Gamma perp, okay. So there is an easy theorem by induction of the structure of these proofs that when you do this translation, okay, that if you can prove something in intuitionistic linear logic, you can prove the corresponding thing, not any translation, but the same, essentially the same formula over in the classical case. Now in order to be able to do that, there are some language issues. Like we have linear implication here, but we usually don't have linear implication here. But we know how to interpret that, right? So on this side, for example, we think of A, implies B as being definitionally equal to, anybody remember? A perp par B, right? So this is a multiplicative disjunction, so this is like not A or B, which is the classical interpretation. This is like not A, this is like B, and this is like or, okay? Except it's not the plus, which would be the additive, but it's a multiplicative because this is also multiplicative, okay? Okay, so then this is an easy inductive theorem. Okay, so that's one component. Um, the other component I think we need, let me just check. Uh, right. So we need that um, the translation of A with respect to bottom is equivalent in the classical linear logic sense uh, to A. I got that right. Okay. Um, so if you think about this, some kind of just approximately like a double negation. This is like this becomes not not a, and so that should be equivalent to a in the classical sense. Of course, it would be false in the intuitionistic sense, right? Because we're you know this is this doesn't have a double negation. This one does, so they wouldn't be equal. And so this you can do by induction over the structure of a. Okay. So you prove this by induction on A. Um, so it's, it's actually a very easy calculation. Essentially, we already, I think we looked through at a couple of cases that some formula is equal to its translation, okay? Uh, equivalent to its translation in, okay. So now the question is how do we piece these things together in order to get this other direction? So let's try that, okay? So we start with this, right? So we start with, we have not P um, sigma with respect to P, and we're trying to prove P, okay? And if you're trying to prove, this is intuitionistic, and we're trying to get to the fact that we can prove sigma in the classical case, right? That's what we're trying to do, okay? So let's expand this out, okay, just to be explicit. So sigma consists of a bunch of A's, okay? So we would have not P of translation of A1 with respect to P, and then we would have not sub P translation of AN with respect to P, and we're trying to prove P. Okay, so that's what it actually looks like. Okay, and we're still in intuitionistic linear logic. Okay. Um, so now what do we do next? Yeah? Well, we can move everything to the side. Yeah, we now need to use this lemma here, right? Now, it, now we need to make a step from intuitionistic provability to classic provability, right? We need to make the step at some point. So let's do it now, okay? So what we find is that we have, well, there's no question mark because this context is actually empty, right, in the translation. So all we get is the, the negation of all of these, so we get not with respect to P A1, P perp, all these things, and then not P um, 
respect to a n, respect to p, and then perp, and then p. And the turnstile now is here. So at this point, we are, are in classical linear logic. The, the, uh, the reverse, I'm trying to go from here to here. So I'm trying to show that sigma can be proved in classical linear if and only if this one. So from here to here, we already proved. And now we have to go from here to here. Um, let there be light. OK. Um, OK. So eventually, we want to end up with being saying, oh, sigma is true, right? OK, so we got to this point, right? If you know this, then we know this. That's just expanding the definition of it. Then we get to here, OK? So now let's expand the definition again. What does this mean? This means not p of translation of a, 1 with respect to p. What does that mean? It means translation of a1 with respect to p linearly implies p, right? What's the negation of that? in classical linear logic. So let's write over here. So if we take not p of a, we take the negation. That's um, a implies p negated. And what is that? It's the negation of a perp par b. And that is a tensor B perp, right? Yeah? Oh, sorry, P, yes. Yeah? I just want to point out that we might want to mention that in the last lecture, yeah. there was a mistake. There was a typo somewhere, yeah. Right. I can make typos even without a keyboard. OK. So I think we got it right this time, though. So the negation of implication in classical linear logic, we say A implies B is false. It means that A is true and B is false, which is what this is also says here. And we just have to make sure that when we say and, we mean the multiplicative version. Right? So if A does not imply B, A does not imply P means that A must be true and P false, because it's multiplicative at the same time. So we get A tensor P perp, OK? OK. So if you expand that out, what do we have to show over here? This would be the translation of A1 tensor with respect to P, tensor P perp. And this would be translation of An with respect to P, tensor P perp, and then P. And we're still, of course, in classical linear logic at this point. OK, what are we trying to get to? OK. Um, we're trying to get to, maybe we can prove sigma, but sigma is just, is it a1, an, right? So we're going to get from here to here, right? OK. Now comes the real the real insight in this translation. Right? Up to this point, we're just pushing symbols around. How do we get from that this is provable in classical linear logic to the fact that this is provable in classical linear logic? Yeah? OK, so that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to say there's a proof of this okay, for P being an arbitrary proposition. right? We've just shown by reasoning that we can prove this for any P. Okay. Where P is a proposition of variable which doesn't occur in the AIs. right? We choose it to be different from anything that we already had. What that means is that whenever we can prove something with a proposition of variable in it, we can substitute for that variable and we get a valid theorem out because we can substitute it in the whole proof. Right? So that's parametricity of a proof for logic variables. So we want to exploit the fact that this works for any P and pick one that is particularly advantageous okay, to get a consequence of that. From there, we should be able to get to here. So what do we pick for P? Bottom, yeah. So I kind of gave it away by putting this lemma here. right? 
the, you know, we have to instantiate P with bottom in order to be able to even use this lemma. Okay, so what do we get out of that? We get the translation of A1 with respect to bottom tensor. Okay, what is the, the negation of, of bottom? It's one, right? And here we have the translation of AN with respect to bottom tensor one. And then here we get bottom, right? Okay, and that's by substitution. Okay, so how do we get from here to here? Right, so we can use uh, A tensor one is equivalent to A, right? And we can use, we can prove that in classic, classic linear logic and do a cut with that, right? I guess we do n cuts of that nature and then we get A1 comma bump to A n would be provable. How we get rid of the bottom? We cut with bottom? Well, the bottom right will go in the opposite direction. So we know it's provable with bottom, but we also know that bottom proves nothing like this, right? That's the left rule for it. And so we can cut that out and we get, we get rid of that. So at this point, what we have is the interpretation of A1 with respect to bottom all the way to AN with respect to bottom. That's what we know. And now we can use this lemma here, using cut again, right, n times, in order to conclude this. Okay. So the magic of the double negation translation is that in this direction, um, well, in this direction here, we just have to be very careful to design this translation so that anything that happens on the right in CLL can be mapped in, in the intuitionistic case to the appropriate rule on the appropriate side. And we use the double negation to move things from the left and the right. Remember that we had those lemmas that says we can move things around if they have negations in front of them, right? If the conclusion is P, that was our trick there. Okay, so from here to here, we just engineered it so that this could be done. And we do it very carefully that the only things that we introduce here are things which remain equivalent to what they were on the classical side, okay? And then we exploit the parametricity of the translation to actually instantiate it with bottom. And so in order to get the thing in the other direction, because if something is provable intuitionistically, it's natural interpretation of the classical case is also provable classically. Okay. So I went through this kind of detail because this is a very, very important technique. Okay. You see this coming up over and over again uh, for different logical interpretations. And the, the structure of the argument is almost always the same. So this is a very important thing to know. Okay. Are there questions about this, what's on the board here? Are we, are we clear on, on the way the proof works? How did you do the cut with the bottom left rule? Because that's not in classical linear logic, right? Okay, so in classical linear logic, it would be a cut with the one right rule because um, bottom perp equals one. So we cut it with this proof. So this and this are cut together because we cut a formula with its negation. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm sorry, I should have done it this way in the first place, but I always think this way. So yeah, thanks for pointing out that we need to dualize that, yeah. Okay, so that's the proof. Um, and so this is a nice thing, okay? So now we know that if you really want to do classical linear logic, one way to do it is to interpret these things and just try to derive a contradiction, okay, in the intuitionistic case. It doesn't even have to be a contradiction, but of course you can substitute bottom and get a contradiction instead, okay? So that is nice, okay? Um, you can optimize this translation, okay? So there's a there's different ways of doing that. The way we did it was the very naive way where we, we insert a double negation whenever it was useful without thinking whether one can take a shortcut. It turns out most of the formulas you can actually translate from here to here without changing them. And you only need to insert double negations in a very few places. Okay. Um, and uh, 
So there is some kind of informal understanding that certain connectives really mean the same here and here because we can translate them one to one without having to insert double negations. And for other connectives, we need to make a change. So the main connective that changes is that implication, linear implication, has to be translated to some kind of a par. Okay. So you cannot actually do, the, do this translation. So linear implication is a tricky part of that. But for example, tensor, I believe, mm, okay, I'm not sure because uh, we rewrote this paper several times. And in the last, last version, the one that is actually on, the web, on my web page and that I'm going to post for the course, um, we took a very, the na most naive translation to make the proof as simple as possible. Okay. There was an earlier version we tried to do the optimal one where you change as little as possible in the translation. But now I'm not, I'm not really sure anymore exactly what you could keep the same and what you had to change. Okay. All right, so next thing we're going to do is um, we're going to try to exploit this parametricity a little bit more, okay, in order to explain the meaning of different variants of classical linear logic via its double negation translation to intuitionistic linear logic. Okay. So the first thing we notice that if uh, something like, maybe I should make some space here. So if we pick P equals bottom, so we have sigma in classical linear logic, if and only if negation with respect to bottom of the translation of sigma with respect to bottom proves bottom in ILL. Okay. And for, in order to do this, of course, you need to introduce bottom on the intuitionistic side, but I did that last time. Okay. Okay, so that's the one theorem. Um, now, there's an interesting observation. Okay. You can prove sigma here if and only if. And I'm going to have to leave open what formal system this is for a second. If we take the net translation with respect to zero of sigma with respect to zero, prove zero. And this is in the intuitionistic case over here. OK, so what happens when you do this translation, OK, and you don't use bottom, the multiplicative, but you use the additive version here in zero, that there are different things in the image of the translation that are provable from the things that are provable um, here, OK? Because, well, um, we translate it's not into A arrow P or A arrow bottom, I guess, but we translate it to A arrow zero, right? And so we get, we get a different set of things that are provable here. Now, we don't immediately know how these things are related. Like, can you prove more here or more here? And that's because in a double negation translation, a double negation of A is A implies P implies P. And that means that P occurs sort of uh, on the, with the left side polarity and with the right side polarity in the same translation. So if you change the connectives, if you change the constant you plug in there from one to another, it's not really clear if you can prove more or less than you could before. Okay. Um, so would anybody want to hazard a guess what happens when you do that? Somebody who hasn't read the paper or, for, or read it and forgotten what happens in this case? Okay, you're going for the same, you would be wrong. Okay. okay. Um, so, <clears throat> let's go through this and let's see what happens. Okay. Um, so actually, I think the right way to think about it is that we, we analyze this direction of the proof. If you go from here back to here, and then we see if we can add some rules here and make sure if we can, if we can if the added rules here, okay, get us back to something that makes sense over here, okay. So if you start with this, right, nothing changes at this point, right? This is exactly the same. This is exactly the same, 
Right? We're not doing anything here that, that requires, it has anything to do with what P is. This is the same, right? So anything that changes would be after this step, right? Okay. So what happens in this step? Okay. So if instantiated with zero, what does this actually mean? So it means we have a proof of A1, zero, tensor zero. Oh, top, 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 top. Okay. A n with respect to zero, tensor top, and then we have do we have zero? Okay. 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 Under which circumstances can we prove this? Okay, what's the rule for zero in classical linear logic? There is no rule for zero, right? Remember that? There's two rules for plus, right? first and second, but there's no rule for zero because we're on the right. Okay, so is there any hope at all of proving this? Yes, there is because we have the top. What's the rule for top? Okay, so we can have sigma and we can have top and we're done. We can absorb an arbitrary piece of the context. So we need to make sure that we use the top in order to absorb this. Okay. Okay. Can we form a conjecture from that? Question? Yeah? It seems like, for example, if we use the tensor rule to break uh, some parameters, then there's still one branch that doesn't have top. Okay, we have to think differently here because we're not trying to prove this. What you know, we can't use the right rule for bottom here because we know that we can prove that because we started from there to, hit, to this. So we need to work downwards from what we know, right? We can't work upwards. We can't use the tensor rule, right? We need to know what we can deduce from what this, what this means. Okay, does anybody recognize the pattern A tensor top? Affine, yeah. So if you, are, if you have some assumptions delta and you try to prove A tensor top in the intuitionistic case, let, let's take this as a guide. Okay, what does it actually mean? Okay, so it means that, oops, wrong way. Okay, you break it down, you use delta to prove some of the things, and you use some other things to be absorbed by the top. Okay, so what is corresponds to proving A tensor top corresponds to proving A from some subset of your assumption, you can ignore the other ones. So proving this means that you can apply weakening, right? So in fact, this was an idiom in a lot of early logic, linear logic programming. We often use this idiom that said that, um, for example, in the blocks we're planning, we say if I want to achieve a goal where A is on top of B, I don't care what the rest of the state looks like. The way we prove that is we say A is on top of B, and I don't care what the rest of the state looks like. Okay. Because you just have to be able to prove that, and then everything else is being absorbed by this. Okay. So one of these things means that if, if all the things that you're proving have the tensor top in it, okay, you're essentially working in affine logic, okay? Because you don't, assumptions can be ignored. Okay, so that's just an intuition, okay? Um, so now, the conjecture now would be that we can prove sigma in affine logic, okay, if and only if we can translate this in intuitionistic linear logic, okay? Okay, so can we complete the step here?
So what is the characteristic of, what's the characteristic in affine logic? Okay. So the characteristic is that an affine logic can distinguish between one and top if you're an affine logic. Okay? So in fact, you can characterize affine logic in the classical case by saying that one and, and top are the same. Okay? Because how are they distinguished? Well, one means you have no resources, and top you can consume all resources. In affine logic, they're the same because any resource can be consumed at any point in time, can be weakened away. Okay, so we have this if we're in affine logic. So then what happens to all these tensor tops? They go away because it's the same as tensor one. And we come with zero, okay? And then we get to this, and then we get to that, okay? Um, except that this now will have zeros in it, okay? But zero is equivalent to, yeah? Negation of one. Yeah. So zero equals bottom. Because the only distinction between the two is um, this one if you have no resources, and this one if um, you know can absorb all the resources with the left roll. So we have also this in affine logic, right? So we can get rid of the zero by this equality. We can get rid of these by this equality, then we get to these at zero, and then we apply this lemma here, saying that we can prove A with respect to zero is in affine logic equal to A. And the way you prove that is that um, you can use the same proof that you have here because you know bottom equals zero. Okay. So it's the, same, it's the same proof that you had here because in affine logic, the translation with respect to bottom has to be equivalent to the translation with respect to zero. So this is classical affine logic? Yeah, classical affine logic. Is that true that if the subject uh, are equipped, that then the tr translated result will also be equal? Right, because the translation is parametric in this. So, yeah. So that's another lemma. So actually, in the paper, we prove that as a lemma, but it's a pretty simple proof. It's just a structural induction of the proposition. OK, so if we vary this translation, we can now understand classical affine logic. Classical affine logic is just like intuitionistic logic where we're trying to prove a contradiction in the strong sense. OK, okay but we're not done yet. Okay. Um, another thing we want to do, if you can find the eraser, which I carefully hid here. Okay. Um, we want to say we can prove sigma in some system which we have yet to define if and only if. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to instantiate P with one. Okay. Okay, so let's see if we can figure out what that is. Hmm? Okay, so, um, oh, there was one part of the proof which I didn't do, but you have to trust me on that. In this direction from here to here, uh, we have to show that, it, that we can actually do this and ignore the extra assumptions that are being. And if this is affine, that the weakening rule can be proven over here. Okay. So that I didn't do, so you have just trust me on that. Okay. So now let's come back to here. Okay. So we're going to try to motivate it again by going the opposite direction. We start with this, we come to this, nothing happens here, we get to here. So in this point, okay, um, we instantiate everything P with one, right? Okay, so what do we get? So we get, um, this is translation with respect to one, and this should be uh, one negated, right? Should be. And this should be one. Okay, so the question is, can we come up with some, some law? And it would be nice if it would be a characteristic equation, right? So affine logic, the characteristic equation was zero is equivalent to bottom and 
octave is equivalent to one, right? Um, so the question is for this translation where we translate P with one, can we do something similar? How can we get from here to here, where this is now all translations at one? What would have to hold for this to be the case? Any conjectures? I think at this point, the conjecture should be easy to form. What what kind of characteristic equations we want? Well, what does the lemma tell us? How could we go from here to here? What's our only hope to do this? One if one is equal to bottom, right? Because that's the only lemma we have, right? If we trans in the classical case, if this is the case. So we can go from here to here only if we have one is equal to bottom, right? So now we need to figure out what extension or what version of classical linear logic actually gives us that one is equal to bottom. It seems weird, right? One equals to bottom says truth equals false. Okay. So um, that's very suspicious, right? And in fact, if we use top here, okay, if we use top in this translation instead of one, then in fact everything would be provable. Okay, and this would be the extension of classical logic with, uh, with the assumption that truth is equal to false. Okay, everything collapses. Okay, but we don't use top, we use one. Okay, so the question is, can, can we characterize the logic of one is equal to bottom? Okay, so if you haven't seen that, you're never able to guess this. Or have you seen it? Is it hmm? No. No, linearity saves it. doesn't have to be para-consistent. But if you do this classically, I'm not sure what happens. It could be that something like that's going on, unless, but in the absence of structural rules, actually, one can do better. Okay. Rings no bells. Okay, look at the second topic in my list of topics for today. Mix, okay. Anybody knows what mix is? Okay. Yes? For, for 200 bucks. Okay. Okay, 200 bucks. Uh, I don't think I have that much with me, but uh, okay. So let's figure out what that actually is, okay? Um, we don't need this stuff anymore. Um, okay, so, and this actually comes very naturally out of the process interpretation. It was actually mentioned in Jabbar's original paper on linear logic, okay? So if you have, if you think of this as a set of communicating processes and you make a process assignment, which you can do in a way that's fairly similar to what we did in the intuitionistic case. So except that there's kind of no right-hand side, so it doesn't provide a service, but you just have internal interactions, okay? Then this corresponds to a set of communicating processes with session types, right? Not providing any external services, just evolving internally. You can take a second set of processes which do the same thing. So here, a bunch of processes which evolve by interaction to some kind of a normal form. Here, a set of processes involved by interaction to kind of normal form. It makes sense that you should be able to two non-interacting processes and put them together. Okay. And now you can do a process assignment here, and these things interact with themselves and get to some kind of normal form, and these things interact with themselves and get to some kind of normal form. Okay. Um, so this rule is called mix two. Okay, um, and um, if you're working only with processes, it's hard to deny that this rule makes sense, because you want this kind of modularity. If you have, if you have um, a bunch of session types which communicate over here in order to achieve some kind of a service, you have a bunch over there. You should be able to put them to put them together, and they should be able to act independently. Okay, but without this kind of a rule, we don't have that. Okay, okay, so. Um, so, therefore, it's worth considering this rule, okay? All right, now there's a zero, there's a nullary version of this. Can anybody guess what that would be? Our usual nullary versus binary type of thing? Hmm? 
Hmm? Uh, well, this is purely a structure, right? There's no connectives in there, but you're right. It's just you have to turn it into something that doesn't have any connectives. Empty. Hmm? Empty. Yep. Uh, mix zero. Okay. So here is two, and we split them. Here we have nothing, right? So by itself, we can prove that. From the process interpretation, this means that our process is finished calculating, terminated, we're done. Why is that inconsistent or wrong or somehow? It should be okay to just be done with everything. Okay. All right, so let's see if that helps us to prove that one equals bottom in this logic where we have these rules. Okay, so if we have one and we try to prove bottom, in classical logic, what's the, what's the negation of bottom? One. So we have to prove that, right? How do we prove that? We use mix two, and we have to prove one, and we have to prove one. How do we prove that? Right. This is the one rule, and this is the one rule, and this is the mix two rule. Okay, so one implies bottom. Okay. How about the other direction? Bottom implies one. What is negation of one? Bottom, bottom. bottom. This is. How do we prove that? We use the bottom rule, and then we use the bottom rule again, and then we use mix zero. Okay. So indeed, magically, okay, if you have those two rules, then one equals bottom. Okay. Um, and in fact, it's the opposite also. Okay. If one equals bottom, then we should be able to validate the mix rules. How is that? Okay. So let's check the mix two. Sigma sigma prime, and I want to conclude that sigma comma sigma prime. If one equals bottom, how do I do that? Any guesses? Cut, of course, cut, right? There's a few keywords that you can always shout out to answer to questions. Induction, okay, or cut, right? And, you know, usually you're right. Um, okay, but the second question you have to answer is what are we cutting? Okay, so what is the formula here? And what is negation over here? Okay, so put bottom here, and this would be one, right? Okay, so that would be, by cut, would give you this, okay? Um, how do we proceed here? Bottom right, okay, good. And how do we proceed here? Right, so we have to use another cut, right, don't we? We can't use mix two, we're trying to show that it's derivable. Yeah, so uh, um, how does it work? We have to prove uh, I just want to use this. So how do I do that? I can't think classically. Okay. Um, we can prove one comma one, yes. Because that's what this means, right? Cut against that. Uh, and we cut this with one, one. Okay. And well, we know that's a proof because that's part of that. And then this, we prove this way, right? By the bottom rule. Okay. Okay, I'm just glad we used intuitionistic linear logic for most of this course. Okay. Okay, so we should be able to prove mix zero also, unless we made a mistake somewhere. So we should be able to prove that empty holds. Of course, this could only possibly be proven by cut, right? Um, how do we do that? Hmm? 
Yes, yeah, so, so we have bottom comma bottom, right? That's the other direction of this. Um, bottom comma bottom. And what's the other part of this? Is it one? Right? Oh, like that? OK, so this is, yeah, this is the, the perp, right? This is the, the opposite. Um, so the way for one is three, dude. Yeah, one right for the right hand work, and cut again against bottom for the second one. Cut again against bottom? Okay, weird. Classic proofs are really weird, aren't they? Okay, but anyway, so this system, if you assume this kind of an axiom, doesn't have cut elimination, right? Because obviously you need to cut to prove this. But if you have the mix zero and mix two rule, then we have cut elimination, right? But we have at certain points in the proof, we have to decide that we're going to split our goal of proving that into two pieces, and we have to prove these things independently. Okay, all right, anyway, so, if bottom equals one, right, then this is the same as a tensor one, and that gives us a one, and this is the same as a tensor one, and this one here should go away, okay, because it's equal to bottom. Um, so we can cut against bottom, we get this, and then from here we get this by this lemma because bottom equals one, okay. So yes, so what we have here is mix, or classical linear logic with the two mix rules, zero and two, okay. Okay. And this actually has some interest, okay, because from a process interpretation, this kind of thing in the classical setting actually makes sense. Um, so what it means from our perspective is the following. Classical linear logic with mix is the same as doing intuitionistic linear logic where your goal is to prove one. And proving one means to consume your resources, okay. So rather than trying to get a contradiction, which is what it means classical linear logic without the mix rule, if you're working in classical linear logic with the mixed rule, it's like working to consume all your resources, not necessarily to find a contradiction. Okay. That's a fairly reasonable interpretation for what processes do. They're not trying to find a contradiction. They're just evolving until they terminate, right? which is they go away as resources. Um, so therefore, if you want to give a process interpretation for classical linear logic, it's probably a very good idea to have mixed rule in them because that corresponds to just communication until all your resources are gone, okay. Um, now, we actually thought about this for a while, but um, if we take a process assignment to classical linear logic and we're trying to prove this kind of translation into, into our intuition linear logic, and unfortunately what happens is when you do the double negation translation, um, that there is some extra messages being exchanged, okay? So every time you have a double negation, there's two messages being exchanged, okay? Um, so um, there's some overhead if you do that. So it seems better to just do it directly in the intuitionistic linear logic instead of trying to do it classically and then doing an interpretation, okay? Just the way we did it is much more direct, okay, than trying to do the translation. Um, Okay. By the way, I should notice that uh, in the image of the translation, unless you want to substitute bottom here, um, we don't use the bottom, okay, because we just use p, okay, as as a new parameter, um, and um, uh, we also don't use question mark. We don't use the why not modality. However, why not does make sense, okay. Um, so let's see. Um, let me just, in a very briefly, actually, is there more questions on this? Um, actually, we went in the paper, we did the following. And we looked at all the possible things which could appear on the right-hand side. And so we already know top means inconsistent over here. Everything is provable, okay? We get mix zero and two with this one. We get affine logic with this one, and we get the classical linear logic with this one. There's some more things you can put here, because, for example, you could get bang, that, or you can why not zero, and so on, okay? And you can try to classify all the translations, and we're able to classify all of them except for this one, okay? So we weren't able to come up with uh, a reasonable explanation for what classical linear logic is if you, I mean, this translation, 
if you have bang bottom equals bottom. Okay. So if you want to solve an open question in this domain, you can think about that, okay, because we couldn't figure it out. Okay. Um, it's not easy because, um, well, it's easy to write down what it is, right? It's classic linear logic plus an axiom that says bang bottom equals bottom. Okay, so now that's the thing. But the question is, does it have a, does it have a judgmental explanation in some sense? Can you write down inference rules on a cut-free system that makes sense, right? So this, this here is the same as classical linear logic with, what was it? Zero equals bottom and top equals one, right? That's what this is. We don't want to read it that way, but we can write it with a rule of weakening, okay, or as affine linear logic. It's very easy to write down a cut-free system for that. It's easy to write down a cut-free cut -free system for that because we have the mixed rules. But I don't know how to write down a cut-free system for that, okay, where bottom equals bang bottom. Okay, we didn't come up with any answer for that. Um, okay, so let's, uh, do the, let's do the question mark, okay. Are there, before I erase all of that, questions? Okay. Um, So I do want to introduce proof nets at least um, briefly, so I, I want to do this fairly quickly. So the question is, can we add question mark A, okay, to intuitionistic linear logic, what would it mean? Okay, so uh, the way, what it turns out, what we have to do is the following. Um, we have to introduce a new judgment, which we call possibility, okay, which exists on the right-hand side. Okay, so in, 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 in uh, intuitionistic linear logic, without the lax modality, the right-hand side is always A true. If you add this, you have a new possibility, namely to say that A possible appears on the right-hand side. And then one way you can establish that A is possible is to just say, okay, well, really A is true, okay? So that part is not particularly interesting. What's interesting, what happens on the left-hand side, what do we do with an assumption, okay, uh, question mark A, and the thing is that because possibility is supposed to be weaker than truth, okay, because it's a dual for the exclamation mark, what do you have to say? As long as we're trying to prove that C is possible, we're actually allowed to assume that A is true, like this. So this is the... Uh, question mark left rule, this is the question mark right rule, and this is a new structural rule that connects the two judgments to each other. And we also have a cut principle, okay, let me not bother writing it down, but it's fairly easy to write down a cut. We need the rest of the context to be right, okay, so the difference between the lax modality and the question mark, the why not modality, is that here, because it's supposed to be dual to bang, okay, the context has to be empty in order to match up with at least approximately with the classical version, okay. So you can apply the left rule only if there's nothing else here. You get the lax modality, but the other rules stay the same. The only change that you make that it can be a rest of the context here, okay. So there's some kind of what I could say weak applications of this. So like you can say a linear or question mark b, okay. What that is is a function which takes an argument, uses it linearly, and may or may not deliver a B. It's possible it delivers a B, but maybe it doesn't, okay? In a functional language, that would be uh, connected to a recursion operator because it only possibly delivers a result, not necessarily. So it's weaker than truth because there's some function which definitely return an answer. If you say, you know, A arrow int, it will definitely deliver an int. If you say a arrow question mark int, okay, it may also diverge, not give you an answer. Okay, so that would, in the functional setting, you can do something. In the logic programming setting, I'm not really sure. In the, in the um, uh, setting, in the process setting, I'm not really sure um, what that would mean. So I have some kind of a weak intuition that, which I was never able to substantiate, that it has something to do with critical regions. Because if you think about forward chaining, um, 
if this is just lax, you have a context here, so other things can happen. Okay. Um, when you're in possibility, this one assumption that you have is kind of exclusive. Nothing else can happen. So I have some kind of intuition that it might be related to critical regions, but I'm never able to actually figure out a, a good connection because you kind of get exclusive rights. Nothing else can, you stop the world, you can execute, but I don't know, maybe, maybe not. Okay. So I was never able to, under the curry heart as move and to give this something really, a, a really nice meaning, even though I think if you want a type of functional programming, a linear functional language with recursion, you do need it, okay? Um, because you do need to have the possibility of not delivering an answer, okay, if you have recursion, okay? Okay, so that's possibility. And there's more details in the paper. Um, so um, we also wonder if there is a version, an intuitionistic version of PAR, and we couldn't come up with anything, okay? So, it doesn't seem to be possible, okay? So we can get bottom and we can get question mark. They mean slightly different things in the intuitionistic setting, okay? Just like linear implication has a special meaning. They mean slightly different things, but for this thing we couldn't come in even close to anything, okay? Um, so, I mean, I think at some point you just have to accept it doesn't exist and move on, okay? Okay, so um, now I want to talk about proof nets a little bit. Okay, so I'll only be able to introduce them, but I thought it was worth spending time on this a little bit, um, on this a little bit more because it's such an important method, um, and it has some interesting, like, cool results. Okay, so we, now we have an explanation for classical affine logic and for mix and so on. Okay. Um, okay, so what's a proof net? So. <coughs> So Girard originally proposed in the following way. So the sequent calculus, the way you wrote it down, um, it has a lot of um, sequentiality into it because you apply the rules sort of one by one. And as many of you have found in one of the exercises, the order of a lot of rules and the way you apply them doesn't actually matter, right? You can apply, um, you know, you can exchange any two uses of many inference rules with each other and in the contents of the proof should be the same, but the sequence proofs are different, okay? So what he was trying to say, well, I'm trying to find a notation for proofs such that the ones that they actually have the same essence should be written down exactly the same way. There should be no difference, okay? So in particular, if you have two inference rules which permute with each other, okay, you shouldn't be able to see this in this proof representation of proof nets, okay? So that was his goal. Okay. Now the sad thing is that there is, it seems to work only over a very small fragment of linear logic. Okay. So in particular, there's problems with the exponentials, there's problems with the additives, uh, there's problems with the units. Okay. Um, so, so essentially the things that proof nets work well for is the following fragment. So A is defined, okay, we have atoms. Uh, we have um, negated atoms, that's good. Um, we have tensor, and we have par. Okay, so then there's other versions, other additional concept of linear logic for which various versions of proof that have been proposed, but they fall short of the goal that any proofs that should be indistinguishable have the same representation, okay. So, you know, additive proof nets and, you know, have exponentials in there, it's possible, but you don't get a very clean theory. Yeah, you have a question? Um, so, how would you compare the proof net and the Fogarty system? Because I feel they are trying to achieve the signal. Right, so that's a matter of some debate, okay. Um, so, um, Dale Miller and Kalsif Chowdhury have claimed that, um, that uh, proof nets are just the manifestation of what they call multifocusing. Okay. So I haven't introduced multifocusing, so I have to stop there, but it's a certain version of focusing. Okay. Now, Benjamino, who was visiting here and who was here on Monday, disputes that. He says they're different things. Um, so, what he has been actually working on for some years in his thesis before he took a postdoc um, was that uh, developing proof nets for richer logics. But the way he does that, for example, he says that. If you take intuitionistic linear logic instead of classical linear logic, you can have richer sets of proof nets and still achieve your goal, okay? 
Um, and the reason is, the reason that it's difficult um, to have proof nets for classical linear logic is that you lose a lot of structure. There's not a lot of structure left in the proof when you have, very, when you have developed into a net. When you have more connective, when you have more structure in your formulas, the structure of the formulas is reflected in the net and you can um, have a richer set of connectives okay, that can still be explained the same way. So um, maybe you can see a little bit more after I've introduced how they work, okay, so we can see how they're being realized. Okay, so what's a proof net? Um, so, so I think, I mean, the summary of the answer is it's, it's not really clear. Okay, they're trying to achieve a similar goal, but they seem to be doing it in a different way, so. Okay, so let's, uh, um, okay, I can't think classically. So the only way I can do any classic proof is think about the intuitionistic one first. Okay, so that's what I'm gonna try to do now. Okay, so um, pick a very simple proof. Um, okay, A, R, O, B, A, A, R, O, B, E, R, O, C, and I'm trying to prove C, okay? Um, I'm doing this because there's two first things you can do, okay? You could first apply the left rule here, or you could apply the left rule here, right? And um, if you apply the left rule here, you put both of these things with B and you put this with C. If you apply the left rule here, you put A over here to prove A and you take B over here to prove the rest. Now, it's an interesting thing that if you talk about inference rules permutation, uh, two implies left rules don't necessarily commute with each other. Right? Somebody who did the exercise confirmed this? I'm pretty sure they don't commute in general. All right. Hmm? Okay, so because sometimes you have to apply one before you can apply the other because there, you have to focus on one and uh, focusing on the other doesn't work necessarily. So I think they don't always commute, but we still want um, somehow there to be a unique proof structure no matter what we do here. Okay, so I think we have to translate this into linear logic, which is a scary thing, um, classical linear logic. Okay, so if I did this right, this is going to be a perp. The negation of this is going to be a tends to b perp. The translation is this is going to be b tends to c perp, and this is going to be c. Did I do this right? Okay. Um, okay, so how do we prove this? Okay. So we definitely have to apply the tensor rule. But let's say we're doing it here. So we get a perp comma a, and here we get b perp together with b tensor c perp, and we're trying to prove c, and then we break up this, and we have b perp tensor b on the one side, and we have, uh, whoop, and we have c perp tensor c on the other, okay? So we can prove it in, in a couple of steps. Okay, so now we're gonna evolve this into a proof net, okay? And so, um, the way a proof net is going to work is we're going to unfold the structure of, um, of the propositions into some kind of a graph, okay? Um, and so the, um, okay, so we have a tensor here, okay? And the tensor of, is uh, the A tensor B perp. So that is the label sort of on the outgoing edge of this. Okay, and there's two ingoing edges, and the one is A, and the other one is B perp. Okay, so that's the first component, the second component of that. There's another component of that which is just going to be A perp. Okay, um, then we have a B tensor C perp, and that's going to be a tensor node here, which has two incoming edges. One is going to be B, the other one is C perp, and then we have C uh, over here. And that's an edge like this, okay. So now we have broken down the formula into its pieces, okay. Now we introduce a second form of a link which is called an axiom link. And an axiom link connects a, a link here which has a, a formula A perp at the bottom with another link which has a formula A at the bottom, okay. So we're allowed to connect these two 
with an axiom link. We're allowed to connect these two with an axiom link. Um, and we're allowed to connect these two with an axiom link. Okay. So what this is says that if it's really a proof, somewhere in the proof, we're using the identity rule connecting A perp with A. And somewhere else in the proof, we're using the identity rule connecting B perp with B. And somewhere else, we're connecting C perp with C. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. So now if we do it, if we unfold the proof into this kind of a representation, okay, now we can no longer tell which rule, whether you use this tensor left rule or this tensor left rule first, okay? Because the, the proof structure doesn't have that information in it. So we have definitely eliminated um, the distinction between the two proofs that apply tensor left first on this or first on that. They end up being the same net, okay? Okay, so this is called a net. Um, so, of course, not everything that can be written down in this way really is a proof, okay? So, for example, if we have um, A tensor A perp, okay, that clearly should not be provable because if you break it up with the tensor rule, okay, you get A over here and you get A perp over here, right? Not provable, okay? Um, now, if you write down a net for that, here's how we could do it. We could say, um, well, we start with a tensor, and it's going to be A tensor A perp. And so we have the A over here, and we have the A perp over here. And now we'll just make an axiom link between the two. Okay? And so now we have a net. Okay? And so now. The general idea is the following. We always unfold the proof okay, into this kind of a net structure. Um, and uh, actually, I should say there's one more link. I'm s I, one more link that has to do with the cut rule. Okay, so the cut rule looks like this. If you have sigma and A, and you have sigma prime and A prime, then with cut, you can get sigma and sigma prime. So a cut link looks like this. You have um, some proof net, which has a bunch of edges coming out. And these edges represent sigma. You have another proof net with a bunch of edges coming out. And these represent sigma prime. And then there's an edge coming out here, which is A. And an edge coming out here, which is A perp. And these two meet in a cut like this. Okay. So usually these are drawn going down in this way, and the axiom links are going up in this way. Okay. So these are called cut links in these nets. So we don't have them in this, in this net. Okay. But if we, if we have par nodes, which looks like this, so we have a par node, um, par like this, right? So here we have a formula A par B, and here we have A, and here we have B. And then we have the tensor nodes, we have the axiom nodes, and we have the, cut, uh, the axiom links and the cut links. That's all we have. Okay. So, um, okay. so first we can translate the proof into one of these structures. Okay. And then our second goal is that if we have one of these nets, okay, what are the criteria whether it's a valid proof? Okay. This has to be not a valid proof, this has to be valid proof. Yeah? Right. Okay. So in this, in this example, okay, in these, both of these examples, there's a fairly simple criteria okay, that you can apply. You can look at the, if this is your formula here, right, you have to apply a tensor rule somewhere, right, because those are the only rules you have available. Okay. And so you can say, well, is it possible to apply the tensor rule on this one? And what that comes down to, you must be able to cut the net right here. So that the two pieces you get out when you cut it right here, okay, like this. So this ends in B and this in C perp. Both halves, again, are nets, right? Or if you can ask the question for this one of, well, can I do this one first? Must be able to cut it here into two nets, both of which represents proof again, okay? The problem arises when you have nesting 
of par nodes and tensor nodes. Okay. Then the question becomes much harder to see. So here you can see that you couldn't apply the tensor right rule because if you're trying to cut it here, the two pieces are connected to each other and so you don't get two subproofs that work independently. Okay. Um, okay, so let me do oh, let me do a slightly more complicated example. Um, Actually, I'm not sure if I'll be able to do it um, in time. Uh, okay, let's try it. Okay, so I want something like this. A arrow B tensor B and B arrow C. Then A goes to B tensor C. Okay, so an A gives you two Bs. Um, then I can take one of the B's, convert it into a C, then if I have an A, I can get a B and a C, right? Okay, so classically, this would be A tensor B perp. Oops, no, what would it be? A tensor B perp par B perp. This would be B tensor C perp. Um, this would be it's on the right hand side, this would be A par B tensor C, except that this would be perp, right? Okay. Are we doing okay on this? Did I, did I do that correctly? The net's gonna be completely wrong if I did this incorrectly. Uh, no. this, this is a par, hmm? Yeah, okay. We, yeah, we don't even have additive in these nets. This is, I, writing a par is still a challenge. Okay. All right, let's develop the net for this. Okay, so we start with the tensor, um, which has A tensor uh, B par B, um, except these B's are perp, so I get A over here, and I get a par with a B perp and a B perp. That's the first formula. Second formula is a tensor of a, what do I get? B tensor C perp, so I get a B, and I get a C perp. And the last thing is a par, oops, a par, which is A par B tensor C. Some of these have to be negated. Which one is it? The A. So I get an A over here, and I get a tensor, and a B, and a C over here, okay? So that's just looking at the sequence. Now in the proof, uh, what do I have to connect in the initial sequence? So if we don't write down the proof, you can still figure it out, I think. This A has to be connected to this. Um, now here we have a choice. This B could be connected to this and this one to this. Or we could have this connected to this and this one to this one. And the C's always have to be connected. There's no choice there. Okay. So there should be an axiom link here. Um, there should be an axiom link here. Okay. There should be an axiom link here. Sorry about that. Okay. And then um, we have to have some connection between these B's and, and these B's. So let's just say we have an axiom link here and we have an axiom link here. Okay. So that's what the thing looks like. Now we have to look at the, if I only give you this and I ask you, is this a valid proof net? Okay. Of course, it will be mystified, right? And you won't actually know, okay? But there's one thing you can do, which is, if I give you this proof net, can we unfold it into a proof, which means can we find a sequence for which to apply these operations so that it's actually a proof? That's called sequentialization of a proof net, okay? So that's not a, it's not a uh, 
structural geometric criteria, but it's something that if you want to know whether it's a valid proof, you can apply it, right? So for example, you can ask yourself, if I look at this, and this would be my final sequence, right? Um, I could try see if I can apply the par, right, the par rule, which is on the right. Now we know that the par rule is invertible, right? So we could always do that. So that would cut out this formula here and this part from the proof, and now we'd have to translate the rest of the net, which has these two things up here. So then we have a tensor, a tensor, and a tensor, um, and we have to make a choice between the different tensors, which one to unfold first, right? So now we want to look at the net and we see, can we divide it up into two? Okay, so that each of them is a valid proof net again. Okay, so that's kind of the way you can reason it. If I'm giving you one of these things, right, and you ask, can I unfold it, can I sequentialize it into a proof? You would just look at the things at the bottom and you would, well, first you get of all the pars, then you end up with a bunch of tensors and some atomic formulas, and then you see, can I take one of the tensors and divide the proof net into two, which are both valid proof nets, right? Now that is not a, um, so there should be a geometric criterion on the nets that you can check that should guarantee that that process always can go forward, right? Because we don't actually want to sequentialize it because that's sort of like, okay, we write down the sequence of steps, right? We haven't really gained anything. So here's the criteria on this proof. So what we do is we call a switching of the net, okay, of this net is that from every par node, you remove one of the links. Okay, you keep one and you remove one. And you do this over the whole net. Okay, is it clear what a switching is? So we have to pick one of these two edges and we have to pick one of these two edges. That gives us a graph, okay, with two fewer, in this case, with two fewer edges than we had before, yeah? And right, and then we have to check that the resulting graph is acyclic. Okay. Okay, so we have a valid proof net if for every switching, no matter how you pick the edges coming out of the pars, the resulting graph is acyclic. Okay. Um, and then there is a, there's a proof, okay, which I don't understand, okay, uh, because I haven't really tried to understand it, but um, there's a proof that says that if you have actually, um, it's, it's not that I haven't tried to understand it, but it's in French, let's put it that way, okay. Um, if for every switching, the resulting graph is acyclic, then indeed you can, un you can sequentialize it into a proof, okay. And moreover, if you take a proof and you translate it, you will always get one of these that satisfy the property. Okay. So I won't try to attempt to do this proof in this, in this or any other lecture in this course. But I think it's still interesting to note. So what you have done is, we've taken a proof structure which has a lot of sequentiality in it, and we translate it into a kind of canonical form where you cannot really tell the order in which inferences are applied anymore. Okay, you kind of factor it out. Um, you know, inferences rule which permute with each other. And then you have a geometric criterion on the result, okay, um, to see whether this is actually corresponds to a provable formula, okay. So this is a really nice, elegant result, right. And the only problem is that it doesn't extend when your logic becomes more complicated, okay. Um, or at least it's really not known. So nobody, as far as I know, has actually proposed um, a version of this that works with the units with one and bottom, okay. Um, and uh, it's, it's hard to see how one could make it work. Now, if you, there's two, step, two things out of this. One is to actually do it intuitionistically, okay? The other one is to polarize it, and in both cases, you can actually uh, write down nets which have additional structure in it. In one case, it's the shifts that get you back between the different formulas, the polarizations. In the other case, it's a linear implication, which kind of introduces a synchronization point into the structure. And with this additional information being present in the formula, you can then find again geometric criteria which show um, what are the, which of these things actually represent proofs. Okay. Now this particular criteria on the switchings is exponential in the number of pars because you have to check to the n different switchings. You have to verify each of them is acyclic. It's known, even though I don't really know what the criterion looks like, that you can actually check in order n squared whether this thing is actually a valid proof but it uh, must use some kind of different criteria. I don't know exactly uh, how, that, how that works. Okay, so now you know what proof nets are. Okay, so I've, and they're kind of cool for when they work. Okay, 
Oh, another thing I should notice is that you can describe cut elimination directly on proof nets, right? And um, there's actually just r two rules for cut elimination, okay? So, uh, um, okay, I'm over time. Okay, maybe I'll start the next lecture with that. So you can do cut elimination directly on these nets. And these cut elimination steps, they can be turned into computation steps. So you can actually have a computational interpretation of these nets. And if you define the nets correctly, you can use and actually implement lambda calculus, things like that. So there's other connections you can make with these things. So I'll talk a little bit about that at the beginning of the next, le next lecture then. Okay, so this impressionistic, pointillistic style of proof nets, okay. Uh, but at least you know what they are, okay. Questions? All right, then I'll see you next week. <laughs>